Hi, my name is Eva Galperin, and I'm here to talk to you about who deserves cybersecurity. Uh, me, the answer is me. It's a very short keynote, just me showing up going, ha, ah! just me. Um, and you may be asking, who the hell are you? Uh, I am the director of cybersecurity at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, www.eff.org. Uh, I am also the co-founder of the Coalition Against Stalkerware. Um, you may know me from some of my greatest hits, uh, including tracking APTs in Syria, Vietnam, uh, Kazakhstan, and Lebanon, uh, as well as uh, phishing campaigns against Fight for the Future. Uh, I helped to put together EFF's uh, privacy and security guide uh, called Surveillance Self-Defense, and also our guide to uh, people who want to do security training uh, called the Security Education Campaign. Companion, because it turns out that uh, people in information security and tech are some of the worst trainers on earth. Really, we're so very bad. Uh, you may also know me from some of my work and activism around stalkerware. Uh, and finally, uh, you may know me for some of my work around uh, physical trackers, such as uh, Chipolo and the AirTag and Tile, uh, which we will be talking about a little bit later in this keynote. Uh, who the hell is the Electronic Frontier Foundation? I hear two, possibly three of you thinking and or saying. Uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation is a digital civil liberties organization. We've been around since 1990, which means that we are as old as the web, uh, but not as old as the internet. And also, I we know the difference. Uh, we have 40,000 members all over the world. Uh, and essentially, we uh, we have uh, three different kinds of people at our, at our organization. Uh, we have activists who get out on the ground and organize protests and uh, write to your uh, local uh, representative uh, who, you know, sort of... Uh, organize people uh, in order to do the things that we feel that really uh, need to be done in order to protect uh, your, your civil liberties online, to make sure that when you go on online, your rights come with you. Uh, we have an entire floor of uh, angry uh, civil liberties lawyers uh, who file uh, what we call impact litigation lawsuits, lawsuits that we think are going to create good new precedent in the area of digital civil liberties uh, or help to strike down bad precedent. Uh, we largely do that in the United States, but we also have uh, an international team that works in sort of uh, in other ways uh, and, and not through the courts. Uh, we also have a uh, public interest technology team, which I am part of. And uh, we do two kinds of things. The first is that uh, public interest technology works on uh, some projects you may be familiar with, uh, such as CertBot or Privacy Badger. So if you enjoy uh, getting you know, free uh, TLS uh, you know, certificates on, uh, online with just a couple of clicks, you're welcome. Uh, CertBot, I think, just issued its three billionth certificate. So we're very excited about that. Uh, and we also have engineers who do uh, the sort of broader public interest technology, which is uh, which is what I do on a team called Threat Lab. Uh, and uh, we look at the problems that are affecting particularly vulnerable populations. So uh, that can be uh, women, activists, journalists, LGBTQ populations, uh, religious and ethnic minorities, uh, disabled people, children, um, students, uh, just generally anybody whose concerns tend to be sort of pushed to the side and marginalized when it comes to uh, to building products or putting together uh, policies. Uh, this also includes some really interesting consumer work because let me tell you, uh, increasingly in the digital world, the consumer is uh, is pushed uh, to the side in spite of the fact that they're usually the person who is, uh, who is buying the product. And I am here in order to do one very simple thing, uh, which is that uh, I am here to radicalize you. And I'm here to radicalize you uh, with one very simple idea. 
uh, and it is the following. Uh, usually when we think about cybersecurity, we think about cybersecurity as the act of securing devices and uh, you know, securing networks. Uh, we want to make sure that everything is working properly. We want to make sure that there are no intruders. Um, and I am here to suggest that, uh, that this is not actually what cybersecurity is for, uh, that we need to think about cybersecurity as protecting people. Uh, and specifically, not just anybody, not just the people who already have power, who already have a say over how everything is built, uh, who are already sort of at the center of conversation, but uh, we need to use our, our power as cybersecurity professionals to protect the people at the margins whose uh, concerns are are really not brought to the center at the at the design stage or indeed at uh, at any stage in the uh, technology development process. And we are going to start with story time. Uh, this is a story I nabbed directly from Twitter uh, back at the beginning of November, shortly after uh, Elon Musk took over. Uh, it is a story from a uh, engineer at Twitter uh, named Steve Krenzel, uh, who no longer works there. And it is his story about uh, the most unethical thing he was asked to build while working at Twitter. Uh, the good news is that this is a story with a happy ending. This is a story about, uh, about a product that didn't get built. So to set the stage, it's 2015, 2016. Dick Costello was just outed as, uh, as CEO. Uh, Jack Dorsey has just come back as a part-time CEO. He is, I think at this time, also uh, CEO of Square. Uh, Twitter had been uh, near death for a while, is desperately trying to find a buyer. Uh, Facebook and Google are both uh, not interested and uh, not calling Twitter back. Um, Steve says, most people don't really appreciate how close Twitter was to shutting down. The 2016 election was the only thing that saved them and made them relevant again, uh, with a small digression. Uh, he was working as a software engineer on a team with a charter to make Twitter work better for people in emerging markets. This seems like it would be very relevant to my interests. Uh, this meant a lot of mobile work, and it was mostly non-visual stuff, reducing bandwidth, memory storage, battery consumption. And app size. Uh, so he worked very hard to keep the app under 10 meg. Uh, Facebook has the money to zero rate people in India, so you can download this 100 meg behemoth. Uh, but Twitter did not. So they finally uh, lost the 10 meg battle when uh, Twitter video launched. And after all of that, and you can just hear his frustration, uh, after that, all discipline around app size was lost. So one of the first areas that he worked on uh, improving was the way that mobile apps uploaded logs. Uh, Twitter, like most mobile apps, logs everything. So every swipe, tap, edit, delay for debugging and metrics and experiments. Uh, and the size of logs adds up quickly. In the app, uh, HTTP responses were compressed, but requests weren't. Uh, logs are highly compressible, so he wired up support to gzip HTTP requests, and he tweaked the log ingestion server to handle these. Uh, he was super proud of this because it uh, reduced mobile uh, consumption, sorry, mobile bandwidth consumption by about 40%. Uh, and that was very cool. So he becomes known as the mobile logs guy, and that sets the stage for why he's pulled into this sales meeting. Twitter was on its deathbed and was desperate for money. And a large telco wanted to pay them to log signal strength data in North America and send it to them. So he says his plan was to aggregate signal strength by carrier and by location. Uh, he worked with data science to find a granularity, a minimum area size, and minimum distinct users per area that would preserve anonymity even when combined with other sources of data because differential privacy is cool. And then they sent this data to the telco and the telco laughed. The telco said, this is useless. So they switched their request and they said they wanted to be able to tell how many of their users were entering their competitors' stores. All right, so at this point, uh, the spidey senses are going off and uh, Steve says, well, that's a little sketchier, but maybe workable in some sort of privacy respecting way. So he runs an alternative by the telco. Uh, they didn't like it, they were frustrated, 
Sales was frustrated. Uh, he was asked to go to the telco's headquarters and figure out exactly what, it, uh, what they wanted. And the subsequent request was absurd. Like, you know, villain twirling mustachios uh, kind of absurd. Uh, he wound up in a meeting with a director who came in huffing and puffing. And the director said, we should know when users leave their house, their commute to work, everywhere they go throughout the day. Anything else is useless. We can get a lot more than that from other tech companies, which is clearly why he's sitting in that meeting. And Steve responded with some variant of no fucking way. There was no universe where he was going to help sell granular, identifiable user location data. This led to more internal meetings. Uh, legal, of course, said the request was fine because none of it violated the user terms of service. It's almost as if legal is not there to protect the users in any way. Uh, normally, they might find another engineer to do this work, but the whole team uh, was aligned on this. Uh, Twitter had ju also just done layoffs, uh, and there were just no spare engineers lying around. Um, his team wasn't touched by layoffs, but half of them had quit anyway. Twitter was having this big exodus. Uh, and Steve had done what he could, uh, but decided that Twitter was no longer a good place to work. And he decided to join the exodus, and he would pull any levers to kill this project on the way out. Uh, a random anecdote that Steve tells in the middle of this is that uh, he got a new manager who, in a retention attempt, uh, said, if we filled a dump truck with money and dumped it on you, would you stay and build this? Uh, to which he responded, no dice. And he says his last e email written to, at Twitter was to Jack. And to his credit, he responded quickly with something to the effect of, let me look into that and make sure there isn't a misunderstanding. It doesn't seem right. We wouldn't want to do that. And then it was all in his hands. As far as Steve knows, the project actually got canned. Jack genuinely didn't like it. And Steve doesn't have a lot of faith in, uh, in the likelihood that this is the sort of thing that Elon Musk would stick his nose up at and say, no, but we must protect user privacy. Uh, so that's kind of where, where things stand now. Uh, but I think that the most important lessons to take from this little Twitter thread are essentially that the, that the power of one voice is extremely important. Uh, that simply having one person stand up and say, we are not going to build that, uh, instead of wondering how to build it in a privacy protecting way, or how to build it securely, or how to do it well, or how to do it efficiently, uh, was really important and effective in that moment. So now I'm going to bring you uh, another example, and this is sort of the, the flip side of, uh, of this kind of problem. Oh, the very last thing that Steve has to say on this subject is uh, that um, you should not underestimate the power of a pocket veto. The kind of stuff that you learn how to do on the way out is really important. Um, so one of the reasons why we do this kind of thing is because uh, you are, uh, as, uh, as a person who works on software, entrusted with an enormous amount of user data. And uh, you are going to be under tremendous pressure to, uh, to use it for evil rather than for good. And the people who would like you to use it for evil will not usually show up and say, hi, I'm evil. What I really want to do is I want to exploit the users. What they will tell you is uh, Twitter is about to die and, uh, and you're going to save it by telling us where, uh, where the consumers are when they get up in the morning. So another example of a, uh, of a product that went terribly wrong uh, is uh, uh, Apple's uh, personal tracker, their, their physical tracker. So they came out with a, a product uh, about a year and a half ago called the AirTag. Uh, it's about the size of a quarter. Uh, it is extremely cheap. And the whole idea is that you pair it to your phone uh, and then you attach the tracker to something that you are worried about losing, like your wallet or your keys or your bag. And the downside of that is that you can also use it for stocking. So Apple... Uh, Apple is not the first company to have come up with the idea of the personal tracker. Uh, the, you know, tiles have existed for a long time. GPS trackers have existed for a long time. Uh, but 
a couple of the things that they did that were really uh, novel were uh, that because they came out with this product, uh, tiles, for example, use a, uh, a network of, uh, of phones that have the Tile app installed on them uh, in order to report the location of lost tiles. Uh, and this network is not always very robust. Uh, Apple decided that they were going to solve this problem by using every Apple device with Find My installed on it and opting it in to a, uh, to a network that, uh, that tracked all of these little air tags. And so suddenly the, um, the network is much larger. It is, uh, it is more robust. Uh, it is much more effective. Uh, and that makes it much more useful for, uh, for long range tracking. Uh, additionally, there are uh, many ways to get around their mitigations, which means we have lots of unaware uh, victims. Uh, and it's an Apple product, so it is downright ubiquitous, uh, which means that we're definitely seeing more of them than we ever saw of, uh, of tiles. So again, the problem with long range tracking is that you can probably go all day without getting within Bluetooth range of a phone with the tile app installed on it, uh, but it is much more difficult to go all day without getting within blue, Bluetooth range of, uh, of an Apple device with Find My uh, installed on it that will, uh, that will snitch your location. Uh, additionally, there are close range tracking issues. Uh, so one of, the, uh, one of the mitigations that they came up with was uh, that you would, pair your, um, you would pair your device to the phone, the um, uh, the AirTag would get, I think, at the very beginning, uh, 36 hours of free tracking before it started. Uh, before it started to alert uh, someone that they might be being tracked, and the way that it would uh, that it would alert uh, was that they it would either alert a uh, a nearby phone if it felt that it was uh, it was traveling along with a phone or there was a phone within range, uh, or it would uh, emit a beep. Uh, the beep was about 30 decibels, uh, which is, uh, sorry, not 30 decibels, it was about 60 decibels, which is louder, but is about uh, as loud as a dishwasher. Uh, and uh, I was able to silence it very, very easily uh, by essentially just squeezing it in the palm of my hand, uh, putting it between the cushions of the back seat of a car, uh, you know, just putting it a little bit further away from the person that I was tracking. So this was not a very effective mitigation. Uh, additionally, uh, there was a problem where uh, every 24 hours, if the uh, air tag came within pairing distance of the phone, it would reset the timer for, uh, for free stocking. So if, for example, uh, you live with, uh, with your abuser or you work with your abuser, or your abuser is somebody that you see approximately once every 24 hours, uh, the alert would simply never go off. So the other problem, of course, is... Uh, if you dared to live outside of the Apple ecosystem, because <laughs> you may notice that these pop-up alerts only come up on, uh, on iPhones. Uh, so if you own an Android, you are reliant entirely on the sound alert. The sound alert is not very loud. Uh, it is not very effective, and it is entirely ineffective if, for example, you are hearing impaired. So these are these uh, sort of blind spots that Apple uh, ended up with in the original creation of this product. Uh, and again, as I pointed out before, uh, if you live with your abuser, which is extremely common, or you work with your abuser, or you see your abuser uh, every 24 hours, uh, then uh, the, the timer would simply get uh, reset. So this was a really big problem. Uh, people started finding air tags, uh, you know, tracking people um, almost immediately. So there had already been stories uh, with uh, with tile devices used to uh, used to stalk people, and now we were seeing the sort of proliferation of stories around people finding air tags. Uh, interestingly enough, as the uh, alerts became more effective and Apple sort of tweaked things after their 
disastrous original rollout, uh, you started to see more alerts, which resulted in more stories. <laughs> what we should really worry about are the stories of stalking that we, uh, that we simply never hear about. Uh, Apple finally, uh, after I think somewhere between six and eight months, uh, put out an app for uh, for Android, which would allow Android users to uh, to scan for AirTags. Uh, again, if you if you dare to exist outside of the Apple ecosystem, and this was partially as a result of my yelling. Uh, it is actually very difficult to get Apple to write an Android app. Um, the downside of, uh, of the Android app is that if you are concerned about stalking, you have to know about it, you have to download it, and you have to run a, uh, you have to run a scan. Uh, so it does not have feature parity with, uh, with the tag tracking that you see in iOS. And some of that is, uh, is not because uh, Apple wakes up in the morning and decides to do evil, but because of limitations in the Android operating system. Tile also came up uh, with a scanner that you could use in order to scan for unknown tiles. Uh, and it has exactly the same problem, which is that if you are concerned about tiles uh, being tracked by a tile and you're concerned about stalking, now you have to know about the app, download the app, and run the scan. If you are concerned about being stalked by either a tile or an air tag, you now have, exist in a hell dimension where you have to download one of every single app uh, and run a scan every single time in order to make sure that the coast is clear. Uh, this is one of the reasons why uh, EFF has, uh, has called for the makers of physical trackers to agree on and publish a standard, which will allow developers to create uh, apps which will scan for all physical trackers uh, and will also allow the makers of operating systems to incorporate this into, uh, into their operating systems to run automatically in the background, which is better. Uh, are there consequences for Apple having rolled out this product in this uh, sort of extremely blind and, uh, and privacy uh, invasive way? Yes. Uh, just two days ago, Apple uh, was uh, served with a class action lawsuit on behalf of people who had been stalked using AirTags. Uh, so they got a class action lawsuit for Christmas. And uh, honestly, they deserve it. Uh, this uh, was a tremendous disaster. And they have spent the last uh, year or so trying to mitigate uh, problems that really could have uh, could have gone much better if only they had thought about this more carefully before putting out uh, the product in the first place. So if you are working at a company that is thinking about putting out a product or you are working on a, uh, on a project uh, that is going to uh, track users uh, and you are concerned about it being used for domestic abuse. So you're, you're trying to think about the domestic abuse uh, use case. Uh, there are actually some principles that you can use uh, in this design. Uh, these principles are ones that I have blatantly stolen uh, from, uh, from IBM. Uh, there is a researcher named Leslie Nuttall who, uh, who wrote these and she is wonderful and I strongly recommend her work. Uh, the principles that, uh, that she has for the uh, design of, uh, of products to be uh, resistant to this sort of coercive control uh, start with diversity. Uh, if the people in the room who are making the decisions around, uh, around your product uh, are more diverse, if you have a wider range of people, they're going to think about a wider range of, uh, of abuses, and they are going to uh, design with this in mind from the very beginning. The second is privacy and choice. Uh, if there is only one product that does the thing that you do, then you don't really have a choice. And uh, you, uh, you, know, you really do not have options. Uh, it is also really important for users to immediately understand uh, where their data is, where it's going, and who it's being shared with. And this is an extremely important thing to think about uh, in the design stage. Uh, the third is security and data. 
Uh, people should understand who has access to their data. They should be able to uh, cut somebody off uh, from access to their data uh, quickly and decisively. Um, as their you know, sort of threat model changes, because one of the uh, areas in which we really see a lot of coercive control is that first, you trust people. Uh, your abuser does not show up on day one telling you that they are an abuser. Your abuser shows up on day one telling you that they are the best thing that has ever happened to you. It's only later that you find out that you need to cut them out of everything. Uh, and the, the fourth principle is to combat gaslighting. Uh, this involves logging. You just show people exactly what is being done, uh, who is logging in, when are they logging out, where are they logging in from, uh, make it clear uh, what, you know, what users are doing what. And part of this is because gaslighting is really central to, uh, to this sort of coercive control and, uh, and domestic abuse. And finally, technical ability. Uh, one of the big problems that we see with, uh, with products that are used as part of coercive control is that uh, the user interface is very complicated and it, uh, it frightens uh, already frightened uh, survivors of abuse. Uh, it is very common in cases of coercive control and domestic abuse for the abuser to simply have control over everything in the house. They are the person who is the admin. They are the person who has installed the cameras. They're the person who has installed the, uh, you know, all of the microphones. They run the Alexa. Uh, they run Ring, and uh, the. Uh, Survivor simply doesn't know how any of these things work and finds them very intimidating. So it's really important that you take into account all of the different kinds of levels of, uh, of technical ability that you may encounter. And last of all, uh, if, uh, if there is nothing else that you, uh, that you take out of this keynote, uh, I would like for you to understand that, that you matter, uh, that your decisions matter, that uh, your design decisions matter, the, the times when you take a stand uh, in order to protect people who are being left out of the conversation uh, or to question whether or not a product should be built at all also matter. Uh, and I can tell you that it is extremely important that you stand up because if you stand up, other people will stand up. And if you don't stand up, I promise you, no one will. Thank you so much. <laughs>